Hi, folks. We'll give a couple more minutes for everybody to join before we start the meeting. Hi, Flip. Hi. I brought, I'll bring, are you coming tomorrow? I am. Oh, John is. Oh. John is. I'm okay. doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'll show you that. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, Maggie, yes, you can make a public comment today. Thank you. You are first in line. And Nikki, this is uh, what my hair looks like when I have to actually blow dry it to leave the house so that it doesn't freeze while wet. Uh, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's also the product of me not getting a haircut during a pandemic. <laughs> um, so it's gotten quite long, um, but I... Uh, I am lucky in that I work for the health department. Um, I was the absolute last tier of health department employee to um, get the vaccine, but uh, I, I got the vaccine today. I got my first dose. And so I did have to drive over to Reeser Stadium and my hair would have frozen if I had left the house. <laughs> That's awesome. How do you feel? My arm hurts. My arm hurts. Yeah. But other than that, um, I mean, who knows? We'll, we'll see. If I start to get dingy about halfway through the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> <Still not>. um, <laughs> yes, let me know. I am admitting everyone from the waiting room, which is why I'm a little distracted. All right, it is 4.01. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and get the meeting started. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's great to see your faces. Uh, and I see many of our board members here. Paula, our note taker, how is your audio? Yes, I can hear you just fine, Julie. Okay, great. We're Thank good. You. Okay, thanks. Well, we have a lot to cover tonight. Um, the, as many of you know, the HOPE Advisory Board collected copious public feedback in November and December. Uh, and so uh, myself and our HOPE Advisory Board intern Isna Vakas and uh, some of the executive committee members are gonna go over all of the public feedback tonight. It is a lot. It's a lot to take in. Uh, the PowerPoint will be shared out and posted on the website uh, so that people can take time to read through it and digest it and then um, and, and be able to try to understand all of the public feedback that we've gotten. I'm going to go ahead and start screen sharing to get going with our presentation. I'm continuing to admit people. So if there's a lag in what I'm doing, I apologize for that. Thanks for your patience. So for everybody doing Zoom, um, you're gonna be muted. And um, Jim, can I ask you to please send the meeting invite with the Zoom link to Reese? He is texting that he can't find the Zoom link. Thank you, Jim. You are welcome to share your video um, and please stay muted until you are going to um, be asking a question or speaking. Um, I'd also ask that if you have a question about something um, to please type it in the chat um, and we'll have time for questions as we go through. So just uh, for a meeting overview, um, as we do always, we'll talk about our agreements and culture. We'll have some time for public comment. I know we have one person attending today who wants to make a public comment. I apologize, I need to start our video. Oh good, it looks like it is started. Good, yes, we are recording. 
Uh, we'll go over some logistics. Uh, we'll go over some community updates. And then there, the bulk of our meeting is going to be a presentation on all of the community feedback that was received. Um, there is feedback from the online surveys, from client surveys that were collected in person, thanks to incredible providers who made sure that their clients' um, feedback was included and qualitative feedback that came in from listening sessions and also from write-in responses to all of the surveys. Just as a touchstone for our agreements to our culture and conduct here, um, please be kind uh, and respectful and open-minded um, and we will approach this with transparency and curiosity. To remember where we are in our process, we just finished our community engagement on our four topic areas. Um, and now in January, we're reviewing all of the public feedback and going into February and March, we'll be drafting policy recommendations. All right, if you have a public comment that you would like to make, I'm going to check uh, and go ahead and stop sharing. Um, the only one that I saw so far uh, was Maggie Cooper. Maggie, thanks for being here tonight. If anybody else wants to make a comment, please type into the chat and I'll also give an opportunity for people who've called in. Um, Maggie, you have the floor. If you can try to limit your comment to two to three minutes because we do have a packed agenda tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, Maggie, you are not unmuted. Can you unmute yourself? There Thank you. It certainly does seem like you have a pretty packed agenda, so I will make this um, brief and clear, I hope. So um, I've been involved in um, the HOPE Advisory Board before it was the Advisory Board because I uh, really uh, I really hoped that our, our community could find a way to discuss providing services for the unhoused um, individuals in our community without uh, the conflict that we've had in the past. It is just such a divisive comment or topic that I had hoped we could talk about it in a sane way and maybe do some collaboration with each other. But in December, I was pretty surprised um, by the city council meeting around Unity Shelter. And so it caused me to go back and look at the uh, bylaws for the HOPE Advisory Board just to make sure that I hadn't misunderstood. And sure enough, under your vision, it says, in order to best use scarce resources, and that's your num that's in the first portion of your value, of your values, and acknowledging the limitations of funding and concerning impact on safety and livability, that the Hope Advisory Board then also will survey uh, the advisory board with oversight by the executive committee will be responsible for providing input and recommendations regarding actions outlined and it will it will it will review this the county system it will also create a report and that it will annually assess funding i think the most important thing about the funding is that if there is when the topic is funding the advisory board, not the executive committee, actually controls in that matter. And so um, the most recent uh, dispersal of funds, the CARES Fund, to Unity Shelter in combination with their regular money has increased their budget to $250,000. And when you look at how that money was spent, uh, I find some very troubling expenditures. $1,000 uh, $1,000 a month for Wi-Fi, um, two staff people, or one staff person for every two campers, uh, a case manager, social worker um, for, to the tune of $4,000. And when you add all of this up, it comes to slightly less than $1,800 a month per camper. But that money is only spent for 24 people. And my question here is, what are we providing for the other campers? Uh, what are they supposed to do? And so it is my view that perhaps this, um, 
this shouldn't have happened in the way that it did, that the shelter, the Unity Shelter, should have put their proposal in front of Hope Advisory Board and allowed them to do the work that their bylaws clearly indicate. There are seven different references in your bylaws about how Hope Advisory Board is the oversight committee for uh, funding. And so I'm here today because I am concerned that we are expending our money in ways that are less wise and, than they should be, and therefore not uh, providing uh, services in the way that we should to as broad a group as we possibly can. And that concludes all I have to say today. Thank you for your public comment, Maggie. Um, because it talks about our bylaws, um, I'd love to just respond briefly. Um, and Commissioner Ogero, I, I think you might have a good response to this because we just touched on this topic with the executive committee as well. Would you like to take this? Certainly. Um, when we put those bylaws together, they certainly envisioned that role. It's not a role we um, exercise at this time because we do not have oversight over the city's CDBG dollars. We'd also do not have oversight over the city's CARES Act dollars. Um, and uh, so we don't have a, uh, we don't manage any monies right now, but um, we hope to down the road. The, um, those decisions were made by the city council and the city of Corvallis in response to urgent need in the context of COVID-19. Um, and they were, uh, so I think that the best people to speak to the specifics of that are likely to be councillors um, Mon and Napak, who are members of the HOPE board. I do know, however, that they were also made those decisions in the context of the CARES Act dollars expiring on December 30th of last year. That was the best information we had at that time, and all dollars had to be obligated and committed in order to make that managed camping possible in, in a very, very short period of time. So it was a challenging situation at best. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. The HOPE board does not currently have oversight. Once we have a plan and it's approved by the city council and the board of commissioners, then we will be able to um, evaluate uh, funding that moves forward but we don't have that primary plank of our work yet. We don't have that plan in place. So thank you, Commissioner Arsha. Ask a, just a clarifying question, Commissioner. Would you mind? Sure. So I, it is correct that the HOPE Advisory Board is responsible for reviewing the overall funding for the county um, and for around unhoused services and then creating a report to avoid duplication of services and to break down the silos and avoid this, this scenario where 24 people got uh, a lot of money and then a bunch of other people got nothing. I, um, it, generally speaking, moving forward, I would agree this COVID circumstance is different. And there is also, you have to understand what's going on in the city council's decision-making context at this time of trying to move into a managed camping context and in the long run, reduce or eliminate uh, unmanaged camping. Um, and this is one step towards a strategy. So yes, it, it is, it, um, it's one element of a much bigger picture. I'm gonna leave it there because I'm not on city council. I was not involved directly in that decision-making, but it's decision-making that has occurred um, under pressure um, of a pandemic and uh, very uncertain funding. Uh, is it ideal? No. And in the, in the long run, when we are uh, looking at the overall system, uh, we would be looking to make sure that we can uh, support the most people possible in the whole continuum of need. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Um, I don't want to spend more time on that just because of our agenda tonight, um, but I think following up with you as we have more information is definitely warranted. Are there any folks on the phone who wanted to make a public comment? Please unmute yourself at this time if you wanted to. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and screen share again. Uh, give me just one second, please. So we have some logistics to take care of. We need to vote to approve the minutes from December. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take roll as we vote. Um, so go ahead and unmute yourself and you can say aye or nay or abstain if you weren't at the meeting uh, so that we know that you are here and that you voted on the minutes. Uh, Flip Anderson. I'm here and I want to actually make a correction to the minutes. Oh. I was reading through the, um, it's way down at the bottom of the first page under section four announcements and updates where it says Flip Anderson partners with Willamette River Keepers doing cleanup around railroad tracks and near tree farm by First Congregational Church. I did show photos taken at the tree farm property by the Congregational Church, but these photos were taken when I was doing sort outreach. I did not participate with this particular cleanup in the tree farm. The work that everyone saw in the slideshow was actually done by unhoused individuals who were camping in the tree farm. The photos show their well-intentioned efforts to clean up abandoned campsites. Thank you, Flip. Um, we will go ahead and tweak that so that it is factual. And maybe I will have you just email me um, a sentence that describes it factually um, as an update. Um, and I forgot that we also need a motion to approve the minutes. Um, can some, can a board member please make a motion? So moved. This is Bruce. Peggy Thank seconds. You. Bruce moves. Peggy seconds. All right. Now, Flip. I approve. <laughs> Thank you. Lennox. I do not know if I saw Lennox join the meeting yet. So let's uh, mark Lennox absent at this point. Uh, Commissioner Ogero. Um, good evening, and I approve the minutes. Catherine Bisco. Uh, present, and I approve the minutes. Carol Butcher. Yes, and yes. Bruce Butler. Present, and uh, approved as corrected. Brian Cotter. Present and approved. Anita Earl. Present and approved. Joel Goodwin. Present and approved. George Grosh. Here and approved. Barbara Hanley. Okay, let's mark Barbara as not here yet. Oh, you know what? I know that Barbara is gonna be 15 minutes late. She texted me, so she probably is about to join the meeting. Do not mark her absent yet. She will be here, but she can abstain from the vote. Um, Alita Hess Holcomb. Present and approved. Nikki Hobbs. Present and approved. Uh, Christina Jancilla, are you able to unmute yourself on the phone? She's just texting me. Christina is saying present and okay for the minute vote. Charles Mon. President, yes. Peggy McGuire. Present and yes, I approve as amended. Thank you. Jim Moorfield. Present and yes. Andrea Myrie. Present and yes. Jan Napak. Present and yes. Reese Stotzenberg. Present and approved. Linda Tucker. Present and approved. Okay, thank you all the minutes passed. Just to go over where we are and the next couple of months, we have our two last equity trainings um, and I will be picking the uh, time for the February equity training tonight. So if you have not done the doodle poll, I think 13 or 14 of you have, I will be picking it this evening. So please do the doodle poll um, as soon as possible in the next couple of hours. Uh, in February, the work groups will meet to put together a first draft of policy recommendations based on all the feedback from the public. They will be sharing their draft policy recommendations at the full board uh, meeting in February and getting feedback from each other on those recommendations. They will circle back with their work groups in March based on the feedback from the full board to put together a final draft of policy recommendations and bring them back to share with the full board in March. Okay, we've got a couple of updates. Uh, that have happened in the community. Um, an update from our county behavioral health department is that the treatment component for drug treatment court uh, has been taken over by our county behavioral health department. Uh, and so lots of new staff hires have happened to support that work. And we have more new behavioral health staff who have been hired to fill vacancies um, beyond just drug treatment court. One that is a huge one that, uh, that has been vacant for a long time is a psychiatrist. So we have an additional psychiatrist with Benton County Health Department. 
Um, we have new qualified mental health professionals, QMHPs, um, for school-based mental health as a resource for mental health and uh, for crisis mental health. And we have new qualified mental health associates, QMHAs, two of them for drug treatment court treatment uh, and one for wraparound care coordination. Um, so that is great for our county behavioral health department. Um, it is hard to find qualified mental health professionals and associates all over Oregon. Um, and it's, it's true here as well. All right, I can't actually read what I've written on number two. There we go. Corvallis City Council. Um, Charles or Jan, can you give uh, the briefest of update, uh, just a couple of minutes on anything new that has happened since last month um, that has been a change or that people should know um, from the city council perspective in Corvallis? Charles, I'm going to pick on you. There you go. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Yeah, I was just trying to find my notes here. Um, trying to think what's happened since our last meeting here. Let's see, give me one second. I was a little behind uh, today. So I don't think there's been a lot of decisions um, since our last meeting. Um, I believe the last big decision we made on December 7th at the city council level. And um, that's where we made the decision to allocate funds uh, to the BMX park managed campsite. Um, since then, staff has done work to um, make the Pioneer Park area safer. They had to, unfortunately, to do the work that we wanted. They had to remove the people um, using that as a car camping area and RV camping um, to be able to put up uh, the striping and insert the port, you know, put the porta potties there and make it work safer and not near the flood zone. And since then, they've allowed campus to come back through an application process, and there's uh, and there's people staying there now in a much safer way. Thank Jan, you, Charles. No problem, Jan. Do you have anything to add? Oh, also, we um, um, the city did finally we had to clean out some of the um, unmanaged campers that were at the south parking lot in downtown. Um, we did listen to the community. There was a lot of concerns with safety and accessibility for employees of downtown. And so that did happen. It was a two week posting uh, time period. So the people that were camping there had plenty of time to try to relocate. And that has been completed from my understanding. Thank you, Charles. I'm gonna go ahead and screen share again. Um, we have um, an update um, from the Willamette Criminal Justice Council. Um, there is now a task force to look at the feasibility of crisis response. Um, that's also sometimes called street outreach and response team like SORT, or it's referred to as the CAHOOTS model. Uh, but the gist of it is a crisis response for people in crisis when it's not uh, an issue of a law being broken. It's an issue of someone needing a response. Uh, and Commissioner Ogero is on um, that. Uh, Zan, would you call it a task force or a, a lay committee? Uh, the group is a subcommittee of the Willamette Criminal Justice Council. It also includes other members that are not typically involved in that group uh, from both Oregon State University and from Samaritan Health Systems. Thank you. Um, we had one question, um, and Zan, I don't know if you're prepared to touch upon this, um, but any update on what's happening at the fairgrounds, um, sort of in a parallel update to the city council one that was just made. Do you have any update about individuals camping at the fairgrounds? Um, I don't know that I can provide a very complete update. I do believe that our campground um, uh, camping spaces are full. Uh, we did expand uh, the number of spaces uh, in uh, December, I believe, uh, in order to add capacity given the cold weather uh, coming on and the need for uh, car camping and uh, vehicle camping or RV camping. Uh, we also expanded our contract uh, with uh, Chance uh, for motel hotel lodging for uh, medically fragile uh, folks uh, at the end of um, last year, and that will continue through the rest of the winter period. Thanks, Anne. 
Our next update is that the point in time count, the pit count of sheltered and unsheltered community members is happening this week and next week, thanks to a lot of efforts from one of our board members, Flip Anderson, and her partnering with other community members um, at the drop-in center and the hygiene center and SORT members as well. Um, so that will be undertaken over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the last update that I have, um, I want to introduce our brand new equity, diversity, and inclusion coordinator for Benton County, and his name is Joe Hahn, and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so that you can introduce yourself. Joe Hahn, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, as Julie said, my name is Joe Hahn. I use he and they pronouns. Um, you can alternate. If you've never met someone who uses they pronouns, mine would be a great way that you could practice that use. Uh, so you can be more inclusive to everyone else in the county as well. Um, so I come from higher education. Um, I worked at Western Oregon University the last three and a half years and I've lived in the area for a while, um, but I'm excited to start this brand new position and work alongside you all and everyone else in the county uh, to help bring some more equity, diversity and inclusion work um, to our work. So whether that be just consulting or hearing opinions or doing educational aspects or anything else, um, all those other things. And I'm moving to the county in just a few days. So I'm very excited to be joining you all. Um, and I'm here if you ever need anything. So feel free to reach out. Thank you, Johan. We are, there's lots of chats and waving hi and saying welcome aboard. And I will be including Johan uh, in work that we do going forward as our equity consultant, Dr. Jade Aguilar, uh, ends her work likely at the end of March. Um, we will now have an internal consultant uh, in Johan to uh, help us think through different issues of equity and process and inclusion. So I'm thrilled that you are going to be with us. And you're getting lots of thank yous and welcome aboards in the chat. All right, well, we are going to dive into the um, public feedback, um, which is perfect. Uh, are there any uh, issues that need to be addressed before we dive into the presentation or any last minute questions? All right, let me go ahead and screen share again. I want to remind uh, people who are just tuning in the structure and purpose of hope uh, and why we are looking at all of this public feedback, because um, we are tasked with making policy planning and funding recommendations to the city and the county. And part of that process is to engage the public and get community feedback. We got community feedback on our four priority topic areas just to start. Um, and we know that they don't include the broad topic of affordable housing um, or the broad topic of prevention or things like education and outreach and advocacy. Um, although some of the feedback that we got um, through our qualitative feedback responses does touch upon some of those other areas. And so I have chronicled that and made note of it so that it can also help inform some of the work that the board does going forward. Just to remember how we arrived at these four priority topics to begin with, um, you all were data driven. You did research on what successful models looked like. You analyzed the gaps in our system and you prioritized by where the data says we have the most safety concerns, racial and ethnic disparities and vulnerable populations. And as we look at all of this community feedback, we also wanna keep in mind um, what the county and the city can do with policy recommendations. Um, so just to try to tether us um, to reality as well <laughs> um, when we are thinking about what we can recommend. So the public feedback summary from November and December, we had two full months. The online hope surveys got many, many respondents. Um, and sorry, I'm moving my uh, thing around so I can read. Um, 177 responses came for topic one, and that was really geared towards service providers, which is why it has a lower number. Topic two had 367 responses, topic three, 391, topic four, 470 responses. And our client surveys that were collected in person, thanks to all of our local providers in Benton County, um, total 244 responses. So we had a good response rate to include people experiencing homelessness and people in need of services. 
Um, and after we go over the quantitative portion, um, we will also go over the qualitative feedback that came in through all of the different community listening sessions and various write-in responses on the surveys. And thanks to our fabulous intern, Isna, um, we have a a number um, that goes with those qualitative feedback comments um, to say how many people um, listed that as comments in their write-in feedback. Okay, we are gonna dive into Hope Priority topic number one. And just as a reminder, topic one was about strengthening our crisis response services by aligning our services and collaborating to coordinate care. So we asked in the survey, uh, which of these services do you provide? And you can see we had quite a distribution. Jan Napak is asking, can you ascertain the number of responders? Um, I can't tell you the exact number of responders, only the number of surveys that were taken, um, but we can gauge from the range of about 350 to 490 survey responses um, that we probably have somewhere in the range of 400 separate people responding to the online surveys. Then we asked um, likely most providers um, how they would feel about working with other providers to improve data collection and tracking and reduce duplicative data entry and data management. Um, close to 50% of the respondents were interested in working together to improve data collection. And there were a significant number, 22%, um, that were not interested at all. Um, and some of the responses and the reasons behind that um, have been fleshed out in the listening sessions with providers. Um, for instance, providers like Cardiva, uh, the Center Against Rape and Domestic Violence, um, simply can't share information um, because of the identities um, of their clients. Um, and so this will be an ongoing task um, that that topic group can look at um, to decide who would like to share data and be involved in that. How interested are you in being involved in a hub model of care coordination with other providers to meet the needs of individuals? Um, again, we have about 45%, um, no, 46, 47% um, who are interested in pursuing that. Um, and then some who are not interested at all. How interested are you in co-locating services with other providers? You can see the distribution here. There are some who are very interested and some who are not at all. And it really uh, depends on the provider. So this is a topic um, that needs to be fleshed out um, in listening sessions and in collaborative meetings. All right, I'm gonna pause there just for a second to help you digest what we just looked at. That was on topic number one. Um, and a lot of the more meaty feedback on this topic will come out in the qualitative um, feedback that we'll go over after the quantitative. Okay, hope priority topic two. This one also has to do with strengthening crisis response resources, um, but it has less to do with uh, aligning resources and collaborating um, to provide care and more to do with a location um, that can be available 24 seven to people where resources are co-located so that someone can get help on site where they are staying. They had 367 responses online. We asked uh, what services should be co-located on site at a resource center. And you can see the distribution here, showers and bathrooms, um, so basic hygiene, um, mental health, food assistance, laundry, housing assistance, drug treatment, and the list goes on. A lot of people support co-locating multiple different resources on site. And this is uh, question 1B, so it's part of that same question, but this is what fell below the 50% threshold. Um, so these were all the responses that had at least 50% or more of people saying, co-locate these. And then less than 50% of people chose these items like vital records help, child care, pet care, legal aid. We will also go over um, in our qualitative section, what people listed under other. 
that will be captured later. So the services listed that should be co-located on site at a resource center, the services most needed are in that left hand column, the ones that 50% um, or more of people said you should co-locate. Um, other services that could be co-located, um, but that didn't have quite as high a response rate are in the right hand column. How many different populations need separate areas for shelter to ensure safety and comfort for all populations? Um, you can see the differences between families, uh, women, um, people with different needs um, like sobriety or low barrier, which means not sobriety, um, couples and individuals who need crisis respite or who have been released from incarceration. What are the attributes of a successful geographic location for a resource center with safe areas for emergency and transitional living quarters? Um, public transit and public transit has emerged uh, as something from our listening sessions as well. And we'll touch upon that near the end. Uh, safe walking, a physical boundary, uh, accessible for biking uh, and natural foliage. What amenities could also be located at or near the resource center? Work opportunities far and away um, was listed uh, by everyone taking this survey. Um, and things like haircuts or a garden, classes for enrichment, workshop, and exercise. You can see how those were listed as well. What services should be adjacent, sorry, should be available to the surrounding neighborhood adjacent to this type of resource center? Um, and the phone line um, far and away um, so that someone can call um, and get help. And that also um, feeds into the responses that we got on crisis response or the CAHOOTS model, um, having somewhere to call for any issues. Security cameras, notification, and opportunities. I'm sorry, I spelled opportunities wrong. I will fix that <laughs> for involvement. Okay, I see something in the chat here. Let me go ahead and check it real quick. What is meant by work opportunities? Oh, let's go back. Work opportunities on site. Um, so things like grounds maintenance um, or cleaning the area or being involved um, as someone who helps support people um, or connect them to the services. Um, people who are staying there and also invested and responsible for the success of it. All right, moving on to priority topic number three. This topic was about transitional options for safety, stability, and health. And we had 391 online responses. So the way ISNA put together um, this fantastic visual um, is to look at the difference um, in support um, for what's in yellow, the car, RV, and trailer camping in green emergency shelter, in blue managed camping, uh, and in purple micro shelters. Um, so it goes from strongly support to support to neutral, slightly unsupportive and do not support at all. Um, and you can see that most people taking this survey prefer micro shelters first, and then emergency shelter, and then car or RV or trailer camping, and lastly managed camping in tents. We also asked about the level of concern for six different areas. So we'll start with the level of concern for community safety, which is one of the priority topics in the HOPE bylaws. Um, and individuals have the most concern for managed camping and car and RV camping, and then less concern for emergency shelter and micro shelters. For individual safety, um, the greatest level of concern is managed camping and then car or RV camping, uh, then emergency and then micro shelters. Level of concern for litter, um, the managed camping again and, R and car and RV and trailer camping again with the highest levels of concern for litter. Level of concern for noise. We're seeing the same thing here. Um, and you can actually see that uh, people are starting to note that they are minimally concerned about noise when it comes to micro shelters and emergency shelter. 
visibility, managed camping has the highest level of concern followed by car, RV and trailer camping. Level of concern for fire. Uh, managed camping is really far and away um, what people are most concerned about for fire. Um, and again, over in the minimally concerned one, you can see the green and the purple bar for emergency shelter and micro shelters. People are minimally concerned about fire for those. Uh, Jan is asking individual safety. That is for the unhoused or the community or both. Individual safety would be safety to the individual um, experiencing homelessness or staying in one of these places. Community safety is that community safety for all. So we polled about both of those items. So Jan, just to go back real quick, um, community safety was the first one we asked about, and you can see the level of concern for community safety. And then we asked about individual safety. And Catherine wants me to expand on the definition of managed camping as it applies here. Managed camping is camping in tents um, in an area that is uh, managed and screened um, with people to support it. Um, and that's how it was defined in the survey as well um, as being with tents. Okay, I'm gonna catch back up to where we were. Litter, noise, visibility, fire. So that was it. That um, Those were the six different areas um, that you wanted community feedback on um, for concern on those different um, topics like fire and litter and community safety and individual safety. I'll take a, de a deep breath, <laughs> see if there's any other questions in the chat. Okay, moving on to hope priority topic four, uh, permanent supportive housing. There were 470 online responses. And let me move this out of the way so that I can read. Okay, please rate your level of support for permanent supportive housing in Benton County. Um, as you can see, there is quite um, a, a strong support for permanent supportive housing in the county. And if you add support and strong support together, um, you're up at around 67%, 66%. Um, and you can see about 22% of people do not support permanent supportive housing in general. Um, but that changes once we dig down to the different three aspects of permanent supportive housing. So the first aspect of permanent supportive housing um, is developing more housing units um, for permanent supportive housing. Um, and still we have quite a few people who strongly support it, um, about 62% of people who support or strongly support, um, but a quarter of people who do not. And that number of people who do not support um, drops as you get down to the topic of rent assistance. Um, so more people support and strongly support rent assistance to keep individuals in their homes. Um, and far fewer people do not support this than do not support permanent supportive housing in general. And then when we get to funding for supportive services like mental health care and housing case management to support keeping people in their homes, um, that gets the greatest level of support. Um, we're up at 75%, uh, three quarters of people support or strongly support mental health care and housing case management. Um, and only 10% of people do not support at all. Um, and that's half the number of people who said they didn't support permanent supportive housing in general. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, and take a breath. Uh, we are gonna move on to the client survey data, and then the qualitative data. Um, I'm going to stop sharing just for a second to touch in with you all and see if there's any issues that need addressing with that online survey feedback or follow up you would like me and Isna to do. And you can also take notes and uh, we will have another opportunity going forward to give some feedback too. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and screen share again and we will tackle our client survey data. 
Um, 244 responses came in from in-person interactions with a hard copy survey. Um, and it was collected by nine incredible providers who really went the distance to make sure their clients were included. Um, so the daytime drop-in center had the most responses. The South Benton Food Pantry in Monroe, really thanks to Janice Cook, um, who made it her mission to include her clients and to include South Benton County. The hygiene center at the men's shelter location, the women's shelter, our street outreach response team. Thank you to Flip Anderson and Andrea Myrie and all of you who went out there in the rain with your iPads. Um, Pathfinder Clubhouse, uh, which helps people who have a diagnosed mental illness um, and provides job training. COI, Casa Latinos, Philomath Community Services. Thanks to all of you. So hold on, I'm seeing something in the chat. I'll let you look at this. Flip and John, yes, both of you, thank you. They even came to my house to pick up survey responses the day that I lost childcare and could not go meet them out in the field to drop off those surveys. <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> so you can see um, that people taking the survey, um, about half are experiencing homelessness right now. Um, and then we have another 15% um, that have been um, houseless in the past. Uh, and then some who took the survey um, who have never experienced homelessness, but they are utilizing services either at South Benton Food Bank or in Philomath or with Casa Latinos Unidos. Are there percentages of the total survey? Any idea on percentages of the service population? Um, Erica, I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Um, just to make sure I answer it correctly, would you go ahead and unmute yourself and tell me what you mean? Hi, yeah, um, so on the last screen, um, the, yeah, sorry, survey source. I assume that those percentages are the percentages of the total surveys filled out by clients. Correct, yeah, so out of the 244 client surveys that came back, that's the percentage that came from each of these locations. Okay. So then my other, the other part of the question, I'm sorry, was, um, is there a way to find out how many, um, or like what percentage of clients at each location filled out survey responses? Hmm. I mean, I don't know if that, I mean, I can Matt, give you, like, I, I just said 83 came in from the daytime drop-in center and they see about 800 unique individuals every year. Okay. So it would be about 10% um, of their annual clients um, who would visit. But in the two month time frame, Alita, do you want to chime in on this? If we had 83 survey respondents over a two month time period, um, what is that like for your clientele? Yeah, it's hard to say that on any month, we would see all 800. <laughs> Some come briefly and are gone, and others are there every day. But this is, of course, during a short window of time. And our um, daily attendance yesterday or Monday was 90 people, but that was our highest since COVID. And we were running around 50s and 70s, uh, well, 70s last week. But um, yeah, the number of people daily that come has changed greatly. It was about hundreds before COVID and uh, now it's, it's uh, less, but it's climbing back up. Thanks. If that, if that gives a picture. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. I was just kind of curious to try and put this number of responses in the picture of sort of the total service population. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we went over housing status of respondents. Um, we asked, do you live, work, or visit often? And I'm going to check the chat real quick. Um, that only adds up to 84%, Joel. Well, thank you. I will be sure to check my math. <laughs> Isna, can I have you go ahead and uh, check the math? Um, on the respondents um, from the different areas because I want to make sure we get it right. That's, that's um, actually the previous slide. Yes, not this one, but the, the survey source. Nope, other one, oh. one in between. This one right here. Right. Oh, we had some people who simply did not respond. Um, there were on some of them um, people who, who didn't check a box at all. 
Um, so that is likely any discrepancy you're seeing is people who didn't mark it. I am gonna go ahead um, and share with you the actual survey that went out so that we all know what we're talking about. Um, Cause I know it's been since October that you all have looked at this. So we first asked, are you now or have you ever been without housing, a uh, place to sleep for the night? Um, do you live here, work here or go here often? And would you like to have more services here with an other option to write in? Which of these services would you want access to? Check all that you want access to so people could check multiple ones and they could write in an other and we'll go over what people wrote in. And then we asked if you end up in the position where you have no house to sleep in, which of these options would you choose? And people could check all that they would choose. So we had these pictures provided thanks to great feedback from our service providers that pictures would be really helpful for people to understand um, the options they're being asked to choose from. Then we asked a race ethnicity question, uh, whether or not someone lives with any of these conditions, mental health, substance use disorder, physical dis disability or chronic illness or medical issues, gender and gender identity, how they feel about providers working together to help them. And it would mean that they'd share personal information and what's their level of comfort with that. And have they ever interacted or gotten help from any of these groups? And they could check interacted with them or and or got help from them. So we can see just how many different places people are having to go to get their needs met. And that is it. That's the end of the survey. And what we will get into after I present the raw data um, are some um, analysis of race and ethnicity, um, living with conditions and gender and gender identity, and how different groups of people um, chose the different types of uh, transitional option provided and how they chose the types of services. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back to our PowerPoint. All right. So most people, 73% of people who responded are in Corvallis, um, living, working, or visiting often. And that comports with the different providers and where they were located. Um, but we do have a substantial amount of people in South Corvallis, in Monroe, in North Corvallis, and in Philomath. And then also some representation from North Albany, Bell Fountain, Kings Valley, Alsi, and Adair. And when we asked, where would you like more services? Um, you can see overwhelmingly, oh, you know what? The percentages didn't show up on this one. I am very sorry that you don't have the specific percentages, but you can see um, it's the general um, decline um, from Corvallis. Um, but it looks like people want more services almost everywhere. Um, so you can see from that first one, do you live, work, or visit often? All of those blue lines go up a little bit, um, meaning that most everybody everywhere would like more services and more service accessibility from the client perspective. Um, and what were the services desired? Um, the winner uh, was housing assistance, followed shortly behind by food assistance and bathrooms and showers. And then it goes down from there with lockers, mental health care, medical care, job training, disability assistance, alcohol and drug treatment, and down the list. So then when we asked what people wanted, the housing type that was preferred far and away was a micro shelter. Um, close to 70% of all of the clients surveyed preferred a micro shelter. Uh, and then it drops down to tent camping and then a safe place to park your own car or RV or trailer. I'm gonna go ahead and check the chat real quick. Carol is asking why the breakdown of Corvallis? Um, that was a decision um, made by that work group and with feedback from different providers. Um, and Carol is talking about uh, this slide here of live, work and visit often and wanting more services. Um, and that is because Corvallis is a big place um, and it includes um, areas where people might not um, migrate easily because of bike paths or walking paths. Um, and so having Corvallis and South Corvallis and North Corvallis um, separated out um, was something that the work group members wanted and something that service providers thought would be important as well. Okay, back to where we were. 
the housing type preferred. This one speaks for itself. Um, and it also is in line with what we saw from the general community um, not experiencing homelessness too, um, that micro shelters are the preferable mode. So for types of assistance listed in the other category and types of housing listed in the other category where people could write in, um, people also want assistance um, with transportation um, legal assistance, having access to Wi-Fi, paying medical bills, English classes. With the types of housing listed in the other category, um, shelter with their partner, um, barn, long-term camping. Um, and then you can see some that uh, say outside the public library or even a sidewalk or a cave, um, a duplex with daughter, um, friends and family. Um, and what I'm seeing from this um, is the need for a place that's not just men and not just women, um, but a place where you can go with a couple, with a partner, um, regardless of the gender or gender identity, a place where you could go with your daughter. Um, and that also comports with what we are seeing with the preference for micro shelters. Why aren't apartments or rental units listed? Um, Andrea, I think the the assumption was that uh, people would prefer apartments or rental units above anything. It's a traditional, you know, four walls and roof and floor. Um, and so asking um, about the different transitional options um, that are available, um, sort of one step down from traditional apartments um, or houses, uh, that was, I think, the intent behind that. All right. We asked for race and ethnicity. Um, as far as comparisons um, go to the general population in Benton County, this is an underrepresentation for people who are white. And this is something that I can add in and I'm gonna make a note to do and I forgot to do, um, but the comparison so we can see that overrepresentation again. Off the top of my head, the Hispanic or Latino is two times overrepresented. It should be around 7% for the greater Benton County. Native American is eight times overrepresented because they make up about 0.9% of Benton County. Black or African American, five times overrepresented. Native Hawaiian or a Pacific Islander is 10 times overrepresented because they're at about 0.3. So you can see again the overrepresentation um, of people of color and the underrepresentation of people who are white or Caucasian. With medical condition, I don't think this surprises any of our providers um, or people familiar with individuals experiencing homelessness, but we have a lot of people with mental health or mental disability, um, physical disability, chronic illness, and substance use disorder diagnosis or a history of addiction. Ah, thank you, Isna, very much. Um, she has copied and pasted the percentages for where people would like more services question. I will also be sure to add it in um, before posting the final PowerPoint. Gender and gender identity. Um, I was surprised that we had almost equal responses from men and women. Um, typically in our um, population experiencing homelessness, there's an overrepresentation of men. Um, but for these survey responses, um, all of the women at the women's shelter were included. And so we had uh, almost equal. Um, another gender would be individuals who picked transgender male, transgender female, or non-binary. Um, so people who don't fall into the binaries of male or female. No gender specified um, would be if someone did not pick um, any of the genders. So we asked about comfort level with providers discussing their case to coordinate care. Um, you know what, the percentages didn't show up on here again. I apologize for that, but it's close to 40% of people who were very comfortable. Um, and then another large portion of people who were comfortable um, or who were neutral. Um, very few of our respondents said they were a little uncomfortable or very uncomfortable with providers coordinating their care and sharing information. So that's good to see. Where did people get help? Um, overwhelmingly the daytime drop-in center uh, and falling um, in second and down the list, um, the hygiene center, Benton County Health Staff, Community Outreach, Women's Shelter, Community Services Consortium, Anita and Chiho, shout out to you, Anita, firefighters and ambulance staff, police officers and sheriffs, 
uh, the Street Outreach Response Team, Chance, Corvallis Housing First, Pathfinder, um, County Jail, Safe Camp, Paloma Community Services, Strengthening Rural Families. Jan, I'm going to touch on your question at another time, but I think it's a good one. And then interacted with. Um, so let's go back and forth between these two. Um, got help from and then interacted with. Um, and it looks like people are interacting with quite a few different organizations and getting help from them a little bit less than interacting with. Um, but you can see all the different places people are going, all the different entities that people are interacting with um, at multiple different locations. Alita is saying Stone Soup would have been good to add to the list. I agree with you, Alita. That, my bad. <laughs> um, Stone Soup and uh, individuals involved with uh, food banks um, were included in the qualitative feedback as well. Um, so from the provider perspective, um, they were giving feedback. All right, so the survey data, we're now gonna analyze the survey data from the clients um, by demographic. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Isna um, so she can wet her feet um, with some of this presenting and describe to you the differences that we're seeing um, by race. So Isna, take it away. Hi, and you can, let me, you can let me know when you want me to go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Isna, I use pronouns she, her. Um, and so this graph looks at how disparities play a role in types of assistance needed by BIPOC communities, um, which are overrepresented. Um, and through this, we can see how the systemic structure of in Oregon history um, plays a role in determining who has access to what resources. Um, for example, you can see how the black community is more overly, um, they have less access, to, less, less access to housing, which is why there's a high need of housing assistance on their part. Um, this graph also shows a high need of food assistance for the Pacific Islander community. Um, and there's also a really high um, need for job assistance for the Native American community as well. Um, next slide. Um, and then this, uh, the graph also showed that how a lot of Native Americans also chose other as an option. Um, and that included um, the need of case management, wanting supplies such as camping gear um, and assistance for paying for medical bills. Next slide. Oh, next slide. Thank you. Um, and then this board, this uh, graph shows that most communities prefer living in micro shelters over other types of housing. Um, the Hispanic respondents chose fewer options of housing across the board. Um, and then um, next slide. And then over 25% of the Native American population chose other as an option. Um, and that included um, more family shelters, a place where they can live with their partner, um, room rentals and micro shelters with a more community neighborhood that is more affordable. Next slide. Um, and then this is by um, medical condition. Um, and there's a high need for housing assistance, medical, mental health care, child care, and others across all mental conditions mentioned in the survey. Um, a lot of respondents also put an other as an option, which you can see on the next slide. Um, and those. Uh, next slide. I want to just take one um, one brief pause to make yeah. sure that this slide is understandable. Um, so for individuals who listed that they had a mental health condition, um, they are represented in that blue bar. Um, so individuals mm -hmm. with mental health conditions said they are most in need of housing assistance, mental health care alcohol or drug treatment, disability assistance. Um, and so you can see along the bottom there um, how we color coded by mental health or disability. I'm just slowing down for a minute to make sure everybody gets to absorb it. Okay. Um, yeah, and then on the other option for the respondent, because a lot of people listed other, um, that's like the second one on the graph. Um, put in other, which these assistances included um, counseling, finding resources for housing, um, transportation, and supplies like camping gear. Um, next slide. 
I'll just give people just a second um, to kind of let this sink in um, that for individuals with mental health conditions, physical disabilities, substance use disorders, or history of addiction, and with chronic illness, um, you can see some themes and that's why they're bold and counseling is a big theme um, mm -hmm. and help with housing and transportation. And then um, the housing by housing preferred by medical condition, um, a lot of people again preferred micro shelters. Um, and then another thing to note that people would, who suffer from a substance abuse um, also tend to choose camping a little higher than the rest. Um, there's also the need of RV and car parking across the, it was around the same. Um, and then next slide. Um, and then in the other category, people listed places they can stay with their partner, um, share spaces with relatives, um, community neighborhoods, and affordable micro shelters. And those are all bolded because it's a common theme. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Isna. Great job. Um, and just a huge shout out um, to Isna in general because she put together virtually all of these slides. Um, in partnership um, with Peter Banworth, our in-house uh, epidemiologist um, with the County Health Department. Um, so thank you, Isna, you did a fantastic job. Um, let me see here, just a second, okay. So what um, Isna and Peter did was pulled out responses from people who said that they live, work, or go often outside of Corvallis. Um, and so we are calling that the types of assistance needed for our rural community members in Benton County. Um, and far and away, um, it's food assistance that is wanted outside of Corvallis for our respondents. Um, and then tied at second is housing, medical care, and mental health care. Um, and Isna, just so you know, in the chat, um, we have board members who are saying you're doing a great job. Lucky us, indeed. Next, we have the type of housing preferred by our rural community members. Um, and you can see that outside of Corvallis as well, micro shelters are preferred by most people. Uh, and then next it's RV and trailer camping and then car parking. The types of assistance needed by gender. Um, so you can see on the bottom, um, blue is women and green is men. Uh, purple is individuals who listed a different gender, so that would be trans men or women or non-binary. Um, and then for yellow, it was no gender specified. Um, and I don't want to make any assumptions um, of the respondents who didn't specify a gender, um, but um, they did not pick men or women. Um, and so there's a, quite a good amount of survey responses um, from no gender specified or a different gender, um, especially for mental health care. Um, and food assistance. And you can see that um, housing assistance is high, bathrooms and showers, food, mental health. And the types of housing preferred by gender. Um, micro shelter um, is the highest for men and women and individuals with a different gender. Um, and for those who did not specify a gender, um, micro shelters are very close to RV and trailer camping. Um, so that, you know, single resident occupied closing door, non-congregate setting um, is being chosen. Um, and then we also see that men are preferring tent camping uh, more than anyone else. So the takeaways from the types of housing by gender, um, we had uh, people saying they would want to live with friends and family um, or needing add-on specialties for living accommodations. Okay, so I'm gonna take a brief pause and stop sharing. We have been at this for an hour. Um, can everybody go ahead and stand up and just stretch your legs um, just for a minute um, and move around and wiggle your hands. I know that my left shoulder is really sore right now because I got the vaccine today and I just need to stretch out and shake out. Ah, take a deep breath. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time. 
I'll make sure it's available to everybody on the website and via email to the board. And it looks like we have some questions coming in in the chat. Just a reminder that we're about to get to the qualitative portion of the data. Okay, since micro shelters are so new to Corvallis, how might we consider their popularity? Um, Jan, I'm not sure how to answer that. <laughs> um, I think um, some of the themes that have come in with safety, with litter, with noise, um, and with cold and fire um, all play into um, what I've heard from the listening sessions as to why people prefer micro shelters because there's a locking door, there's four walls that are insulated, um, there's a, an outlet to plug into, there's a heat source. Um, and so it speaks to all those different components that people are worried about um, from an individual perspective and from a community perspective. Catherine's asking to micro shelters for those who are maybe viewing this later, could you elaborate on what a micro shelter is? Uh, that's why I included the photos um, given to uh, individuals in the client survey because there is a photo of what micro shelters look like. Do you think that's enough, Catherine, or do you think there needs to be more? I can't hear you if you're trying to talk, Catherine. I was going to try and type the answer. Um, just a, a general concept is probably fine. And, and you elaborated a little bit on it with the four walls and locking doors, you know, outlets, things like that. But for folks that maybe aren't grasping that concept because it's such a priority topic and a priority for this, um, these surveys and the policies that we're likely to put forth, if, if you've got some definition that you can just elaborate on for this recording, it might be helpful. Sure. Um, for the recording, um, it is, um, think of a heated shed, um, an eight by 10 foot or eight by 12 foot shed um, that has insulation and a roof and a window and a locking door and a plug outlet for people to charge their phone, um, a heat source that is safe and is attached to the roof. Um, it has hookups for electricity and there is space for either a single bed or a double bed. Um, and I will also add into the slides um, one slide that includes the definitions that were included in the client survey um, so that it would be um, available to people reading it later. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get back to our qualitative data. Again, um, big thanks to ISNA for helping to quantify all of the write-in responses from the online surveys. Um, as we reviewed all of the listening session information and all of the write-in responses from online surveys, 12 themes emerged. Um, the hub model of care coordination was a big one. Data collection affects community safety too, was a big one. Crisis response or the CAHOOTS model. Locating services away from existing residential neighborhoods and businesses. Community involvement and transparent communication. Co-location of services and mobile services, not one or the other. Um, a village community for permanent neighborhood and transitional sheltering. Staff to transition people to shelter. Funding ideas came in. OSU's involvement. Legislative advocacy and messaging and education needs for the public about what's happening on this topic. Let's see here. Um, Andrea, thank you for more pictures and definitions of micro shelters in the chat. That's really helpful. So we are gonna go over these in detail and I'm gonna pass it over to our executive committee members who are gonna read through a couple of these slides because you guys are bored of my voice after 45 <laughs> minutes. So Peggy, take it away. So um, I don't think I need to actually read, but I'll try to go through this in a, a logical way because you all are capable of reading this. We had 17 survey write-in responses supporting this topic on the hub model of care coordination. And this is really something that a lot of providers are beginning to discuss because um, all of us, or the vast majority of us, I should say, pay rent in some way, shape or form. Some folks have their own um, places that they own. But when we began talking about the care coordination model, we really began thinking that it was 
helpful for people to have a one-stop shop kind of um, concept. And so we began discussing co-locating um, so that we could collaborate with one another, but also so that clients could have that one-stop shop. And as we talked about this more and more, we also began to realize that especially given the environment that we're in now, it didn't necessarily have to be a physical location. We could have a care collaboration model that was um, a virtual hub. Um, there could be online tools used such as Zoom. And then also that we wanted to have shared databases and other online collaboration tools. Um, to begin with, this was really important with the rural areas because they wanted to be able to um, have their clients access services. They wanted to be connected in that um, hub model and having that virtual connection really made a lot of sense. Benton County Health Department um, health navigators and community health workers could coordinate a hub model uh, in different regions. So such as Corvallis, Philomath, West Benton, Monroe, South Benton. And then um, we could work with uh, homeless uh, on the model that the homeless and Vul vulnerable patients work group has that's coordinated by um, Samaritan. So it could be staffed with Benton County Health Department employees and we would also want to uh, involve criminal justice folks. And I think we've talked with you before about the Homeless and Vulnerable Patients Group. It's a very collaborative and very um, broad group of partners that work together. We identify uh, patients or clients that kind of everybody's seeing and everybody's working with. And we begin to one by one start to create specific plans for each of those clients. And so we were saying we could take that process and Benton County Health Department could, um, could, could staff it and begin to work with the, part, with the partners and work through the client groups. We would include faith-based community members who are serving perhaps as a case manager volunteer now and know the individuals. Um, we could coordinate better with job training um, activities. We could include the Department of Health, DHS, vocational rehab for training in that hub, and then um, the HELP program to connect uh, homeless folks with jobs, um, jobs that are needed to be done and folks who need jobs and bring in business owners who are interested in having work done. Um, Corvallis Police Department and Corvallis Fire Department should be included in all of this because they know who some of the high users of the emergency services are. And Samaritan could coordinate obtaining the confidentiality agreements because they've already done so much of this work in the homeless and vulnerable patients work group. Um, they also have folks who are in their systems uh, the data system, which is EPIC, the Electronic Patient Information um, uh, Center Coordinated Records. I can't remember what EPIC stands for, but there are 1,300 people in Benton County that Samaritan has already identified as likely being homeless based on how they've responded to the um, inquiries that they have provided when they have accessed the health system. So you could go ahead and change the slide for me. And then um, the data collection, the thing that's really in, um, that the community is very interested in related to community safety is um, finding out something about who's staying in these tent encampments and um, being able to manage that data. So, uh, in particular, the BMX area along the Southtown bike path was mentioned many times. And then there's also concerns because crime is occurring without anyone, any way to know who's committing it. And um, they're assuming that it's people who are staying in these situations, in these camping um, sites. And so 15 survey write-in responses related to that issue in particular. Data collection that separates out disability for the purposes of connecting people um, to better funding and services. For example, developmental data, uh, disabilities versus physical disabilities versus substance abuse 
uh, disorders or substance use disorder, mental health disability separate from physical disability. Depending on the disability, the person can be eligible for particular types of disability assistance. So if you have clients who are um, uh, who have a confirmed disability, they may be eligible to re receive social security disability, which then gives them an income and then enables them to be placed into housing where they're actually able to pay rent. With data collection, service providers and or city and county could release statistics about how the services are succeeding. Um, there would be data to share the number of people living in particular locations, how many people participated in some sort of an intake process with social services, what that looked like, if there were people being evicted out of those situations, if they were homeless because they had been evicted from regular housing. Um, people who were graduating out of these temporary and transitional housing opportunities into more permanent housing and the number and types of calls that 911 was making to the particular locations. Um, there was also an interest in seeing people being screened so that we're working to shelter existing Benton County community members and give them priority as opposed to people who are new to the area or coming in from outside the area. Um, there's a lot of discussion, no matter what community that we're talking about, about, sorry, my dogs are deciding they're gonna play a little game. Um, so there are a lot of um, folks who are interested in knowing who's coming into their area. Are we attracting people because of services that we're providing or are we actually serving people who have been here over the long term? Okay, next slide. And I think that might go to someone else. Yes, Christina. Yeah. Thank so you so I'm much, Peggy. To, uh, yeah, mute my sound right now so my dogs don't continue to entertain you. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, and uh, Christina, you are going to take over for the um, street outreach response team. Are you able to do this tonight? I know you're calling in on your phone. If Christina is not, I can certainly help. I do not hear her. I know that um, she is on the phone. Um, yeah, she can't see anything. She's texting me, so she's not going to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, Peggy, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, let me continue. jump in on this first slide. And then if you feel like there's anybody more appropriate to pick up the other ones that she was going to handle. Um, and so an issue that comes up over and over again is that we do need crisis response that isn't law enforcement. There could be initial calls to 911 because the um, citizens may not know where else to call. So there could be a 911 call, but some sort of a team with a case manager and either a peer support person or mental health staff then should respond. Um, crisis response is supported by all sectors of the community who were polled and many, many of the survey respondents who wrote information in also indicated that they wanted to see non-law enforcement crisis response. We definitely need more case managers to go where people are who are people are homeless, work with them to get them transitioned and connected to all the needed services. So um, that would be getting them signed up for um, housing evaluation, mental health evaluation, medical evaluation. If they need jobs, getting them hooked up with job placement opportunities. Sometimes what's preventing them from getting housing is that they don't have a driver's license or they don't have a birth certificate so they can't get a driver's license. So it's kind of like triaging where the help needs to be uh, prioritizing um, be prioritized and then get folks the help that they need by getting them connected to the individuals who can give them that help. Feedback from individuals, residents, and service providers is to not have law enforcement accompany the responder unless it's really necessary. And we had 23 survey write-in responses about this particular issue. Next slide. Do you want me to keep going or do you have somebody else you'd like to call on? Is there another uh, member of the executive committee who would like to chime in um, and read this one? Um, Zan has to leave. She has another county meeting to attend right I'll now. I'll just keep going for the sake of time. Okay, thanks. So um, um, 
there was an interest in having services located away from existing residential neighborhoods and businesses. That came up multiple times um, because folks were very concerned about respecting existing neighborhoods, don't put services in existing residential neighborhoods, prioritize taxpayer safety and use of public parks for the children. In particular, this was something that was um, a common theme in South Corvallis. They feel that somehow they're the only location where the homeless are being allowed to congregate. Um, community safety is a priority for everybody and it's greatly being impacted in Southtown, especially along the bike path. Don't put services in business areas is another thing that was heard. Businesses are struggling for many reasons, as you all know, and homeless individuals congregating in downtown um, hurts businesses because other residents are concerned about the safety of the downtown area. So they tend not to use those small businesses in the downtown. This leaves industrial and urban growth boundary areas um, where there's natural space. Desig we should designate one or two locations where camping and parking can happen and have resources available there to address uh, accumulation of litter, the worry about noise and fire and other safety concerns. Overwhelmingly, people support having small transitional and permanent housing scattered throughout the community. Um, but not a service delivery hub in a residential area. Um, some responses that support local downtown um, area or area services list access to transit and resources as the reason why they see services being provided in those areas. So any location could and should have resources on site as well as access to transit. Um, again, the issue of screening for residency came up and you can see that 43 survey write-in responses supported this particular topic about uh, services being located away from existing residential neighborhoods and businesses. Thank Next you, Peggy. Slide. And I know that, um, you know, not everybody agrees with all of that, everything that's being said right now, um, but it was really our job to truthfully communicate all of the public feedback. Um, and so that's what we're doing. Okay. Um, Zan had to step off. So I'm going to do her slides for her. Um, and this was uh, feedback um, about needing to involve the community and have transparent communication. Um, I am seeing some in the chat about geographic equity for homeless services and how it is practiced in Eugene and that Corvallis is wading into that concept um, and that geographic equity might also help with locating services. Um, so just to note that that is happening in the chat. Um, so the feedback that we got from listening sessions, um, and I really want to thank a lot of the neighborhood um, uh, neighborhood associations, the West Hills Neighborhood Association and Central Corvallis Neighborhood Association um, for giving such great qualitative feedback on these topics. Um, do outreach before citing something somewhere, um, a letter about the site, an invitation to participate, transparency, notice, and part of the decision making to have to be a part of the decision making. Um, there were recommendations um, from neighborhoods uh, to have a community advisory committee or a neighborhood action council um, for residential areas adjacent to services. Um, that would mean including neighborhood members in a steering committee committee for the service provider. Having a community plan for roles and responsibilities uh, so that any neighborhood um, or any community members know who does what, uh, who would you call in case of something happening, um, involve the community in the planning, um, have thresholds for types of services provided or the number of people served um, adjacent to a residential area. And the crisis response or cahoots type, cahoots type of service um, also plays into this as far as involving the community um, because it would help address or lessen the impact on neighborhoods. Um, having a 24 seven management on site for places that have overnight residents. Let's see here. 
George is saying these responses speak to me of the need for this group to help develop the metrics that define what qualifies for success of the work we are doing. Um, this group and the city and the county for this group and the city and the county. Thanks, George. Okay. So this one is um, under the topic of co-location of services and mobile services. Um, so there were 63 write-in responses um, mentioning um, the need or the support for co-location of services um, and the need or supporting mobile services. Providers in particular um, supported having a uh, co-location of resources at a resource center on a campus with services for different populations around the campus. Um, so having an emergency area that could also be transitional um, for people to camp, park a car, and have micro shelters for individuals and couples. Um, and then people do not have to leave in the morning like a traditional emergency shelter. Um, and also some of the commentary was uh, to be able to live in an RV without that 30 day restriction. And separating populations by functionality level or sobriety level and not by gender as we do in our traditional men's and women's uh, shelter. Um, so that we have a single resident occupancy of micro shelter or a tent or a car RV um, and a single person or a couple. Um, the one that far and away was listed most um, as far as need um, to be on site and co-located was mental health and substance use services. Have those provided on site. Okay, community feedback supports one location for allowing camping in tents um, or cars um, so that illegal camping can be enforced everywhere else. Um, some of the feedback included making the time, making the camping time limited and providing case management to work with the person on transitioning them to something that's not tent camping. Having one location for food service like stone soup instead of rotating locations, stone soup has I think three different locations that they rotate to on different days of the week at different times because they don't have a fixed kitchen. Um, and it makes it very difficult for individuals who need to access that food. And having a food pantry on site as well for people who are coming to get help at the resource center but not staying there, um, they can access their food pantry at the same location instead of going to an alternate location for a food pantry. The mobile service delivery component um, came in at a lot of the listening sessions and in the write-in responses. Um, providers who provide services and residents who live all over Benton County um, would like a mobile model of service delivery. The way it was described in the comments was that multiple providers, multiple humans would be on a bus heading to different parts of the county on a rotating basis to deliver the concept of co-location of services and service providers, but in a mobile way out to Alsi, Monroe, Kings Valley, and Philomath. The survey feedback also mentions the need for outposts or the mobile services hub to go to rural areas. And interestingly, a lot of the feedback from the rural areas was that they don't want services located there, but they want better access to services. I know that's a contradiction, um, but it is, it is what we read over and over again. Don't put services here, um, but we want more access to services. Um, and this mobile model might address that um, and meet the needs of access without a fixed location. Job training is key. Bringing job training support to where people are instead of requiring them to go to the Department of Health Services or DHS, which has vocational rehabilitation or job training. So the takeaway is that people are supporting some concentration and distribution um, of subsidized housing or shelter. So have co-location and have dispersal of other options. Um, spread some supported housing throughout the community in addition to having co-location of services with uh, emergency and transitional shelter options. That's a lot to take in. I know that's a lot of feedback. <laughs> okay, I'll go on to the next one. Okay, uh, Reese, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you to talk about the public feedback on the need for staffing. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, we have a wonderful police force, but it's not their job to house people. We need staff whose job it is to house people. 
We need more case managers and need uh, to add housing case management to their job to the job descriptions of health navigators since housing is health. We need coordinated trash pickup. We need resources or a designated staff person to cover Native American individuals in Benton County. There currently is none. Tribal resources can help support individuals if there were a tribal liaison staff person to make that connection and establish referrals, also known as doing the case management. We need an organizational structure for a recess center that includes city county representation, local neighborhood representation, local to where the facility is being cited, and representation from the organization co-locating, essentially a citizen advisory committee. And there were 13 survey write-in responses supporting this topic. Thank you, Reese. Okay, Jim, I'm gonna pass it over to you for permanent supported housing um, and also transitional housing and the concept of villages. Oh, Jim, before I pass it over to you, I just wanna acknowledge that Sarah Ingle has put in the chat um, that Stone Soup serves seven meals a week at St. Mary's or First Christian, and they've added two temporary meal sites at the Hygiene Center and the South Corvallis Food Bank. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, um, permanent supportive housing, transitional housing. Uh, guess what? Uh, people who are unhoused also have needs for community and uh, friends like we all do. And uh, so some of the feedback uh, is specific to allowing uh, networks of people to remain networks and friends and communities to exist. And so uh, how uh, the village concept and other housing concepts are uh, implemented uh, should keep that in mind. Uh, and one uh, idea that's specifically uh, risen to the top of our attention is a program uh, and community in Austin, Texas, that is a recommended model uh, for how different sorts of uh, housing options are provided along with uh, supportive services in one area in a village concept. Um, how to do this uh, should take into account that uh, different populations are going to need different things. Uh, and uh, uh, the village concept can be organized with that in mind. Uh, an example being uh, families with children, uh, people with disabilities, um, um, and so on. Um, uh, sobriety uh, being an issue and how a village is organized to address that. Um, People who live in these villages should have a hand in, in governing the village and should have responsibility for making it work. Um, not only would that assist the residents in helping towards recovery and independence and having a job, um, but it makes uh, residents responsible for the success and not just the people who staff uh, the program. Uh, Next slide. And uh, obviously, you know, we're talking about a lot of different ideas and uh, uh, we have to have a way to pay for them. Uh, there are some things that are uh, funding sources that we won't go into on, on this slide that already exist. Uh, so focusing on um, things that uh, could be emphasized more or could be developed to create some uh, uh, new funding streams. Uh, the number of years ago, the legislature uh, authorized local communities to implement a construction excise tax. Uh, the city of Corvallis has done that. Uh, the, the county has not. And that, that's a choice that Ben County could, be, uh, could make. And these construction excise uh, tax dollars are required to uh, be uh, spent on housing related activities. Although there's some flexibility to what that is. Uh, community development block grants are something the county applies for from time to time and uh, could be used in some ways to address these needs. Um, the, the county and the city both use transient lo lodging taxes in a variety of ways. Uh, the idea is that the county could use these taxes to uh, uh, build and support transitional emergency village like we've been talking about. 
uh, Intercommunity Health Network Coordinated Care Organization is our Medicaid provider for the three county area. And they have some specific uh, grant programs that could be used uh, perhaps for uh, the care coordination that, that we're talking about. Um, the Benton uh, Community Foundation, private foundation, uh, may be able to be used to help uh, support uh, the services we've been talking about, especially the, the hub model uh, and the crisis response work. And then finally, there's an idea that comes up every few years in many, many ways. How do we get uh, more support out of our universities in, in any community in, in the state? It's a, a university town, which also means that a significant portion of the town is not uh, paying property taxes. And uh, so one of those ideas is, is for uh, excise taxes related to sporting events and on ca campus sales and to have that tax revenue go to, to uh, pay for housing programs, in part because students sometimes are homeless, but also because uh, university towns have uh, some very particular challenges related to housing. Uh, that can uh, impact uh, uh, the number of people that are homeless in our community. So partnering with uh, the other major university town uh, close by Eugene, Lane County, uh, to see if something could be done uh, legislatively to uh, uh, establish a new funding source for housing. Thank you so much, Jim. All right. So now we have legislative advocacy that came in as a topic. Um, Charles, are you back into the meeting? Charles was having some connectivity issues um, and had to leave the meeting. I don't think he's back with us, so I will go ahead and read this part. Um, legislative advocacy is um, the topic of what could the city and the county look at um, to lobby at the state level? Because there are things that the city and the county simply can't control at the local level. Um, but as part of the policy recommendations coming from the HOPE Board, we could include um, an area on legislative advocacy topics. Um, and the city and the county can choose to adopt those and work with the League of Cities and the Association of Counties to lobby at the state level. Um, and one of the big ones um, that has come out of lots of the listening sessions um, is is to lobby for some statewide intervention on homelessness requirements um, so that each jurisdiction is responsible for um, their own population. Um, and so that you don't have um, people going to one area because there aren't services in another. Um, and then making sure that those bed requirements in each area are accompanied uh, by some funding from the state level to support those minimum number of beds. Uh, Jim touched on the PAC-12 municipal municipalities having flexibility to adopt a local sales tax to help uh, with some of the housing crunch that happens in um, the two PAC-12 towns in the state. The CAHOOTS model funding for crisis response. This is a bill that um, I think has already been introduced or is being discussed right now at the legislature um, of having state funding to have crisis response models uh, throughout the state and not just in Eugene. Um, one that came in um, in the write-in responses and in listening sessions was to lobby for tax reform. Um, for individuals who are wealthy and for corporations um, so that there is more funding for social services and housing um, so that local, local municipalities have funding um, to respond to some of these issues. And there were 14 write-in responses on that. Okay, Jan, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, please, whoever is out there, uh, Julie and Peggy, please chime in if I miss something. <clears throat> so who is working on what and what's happening? I think from a high level, we've got a pretty good idea of all of our partners. And um, Dan, I'm just going to frame it real quick. Sure. Um, the the public feedback that came in in the survey responses and in the listening sessions um, was that people want better messaging um, and they want better education about this. Oh, topic. okay. 
um, and that they they said we want to know who is working on what and what's happening. We want to have updates about this topic. So we don't actually need to give those updates right now, but this is the community feedback that has come in um, that the board should consider as we make policy recommendations. Good. Okay. Um, well, this definitely we can we can help out with that first one. And uh, the second one, constant COVID updates. Yes, we're getting those all the time. Updates about homelessness. Agreed. We need we need that information. Um, hopefully, we'll go into um, coordinated entry at some point. Um, rural education on topic of homelessness and what it looks like in rural areas, in particular Monroe. Yeah, this is this is a, an area of need, I believe. And you know, even for us who are very more uh, familiar with the topic. Uh, every day we learn something new, at least I do. Uh, so definitely want to uh, work on that. Where is the funding for any of this coming from? A lot of fear about property taxes increasing. Well, Dan is not here, <laughs> but I was gonna say that right now we're getting a lot of CARES funds. Uh, we're getting a HUD fund. HUD funding, um, we actually only have one tax um, instrument, and that's the, the livability fund for those who live in Corvallis. Uh, and of that livability, <clears throat> it's a $5 million fund of which $380,000 goes into services. But right now, uh, we have doubled from $550,000 of our of funding. Um, we've had to double that. We're at over a million dollars so far fiscal year 2021, and this is just from the city. And Jan, we don't need to answer this question right now, but oh. as we go forward and we make policy recommendations or we look at uh, the needs for education or messaging or outreach, um, okay. we need to take into consideration the fact that people are worried um, about where the money is coming from uh, okay. and don't want their property taxes increased. Um, yeah, so we need I, to address good, that worry. Good point. Um, well, anyway, the last one, um, success rates of any of the services that are being provided. I think this has been a key issue for a couple of years now, at least it's on my plate. And um, adding services, actually helping these people. Uh, we do have some very detailed information and we have some very not detailed information. And uh, this is from the, the providers. And um, yes, uh, this is definitely something that we need to flesh out. Thank you so much, Jan. Yeah, there were 13 write-in responses from the surveys about the needs for um, messaging and education about what's happening. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize again our qualitative data that came in from listening sessions and write-in responses that we had these 12 themes. Um, and I put them in order of our topic areas. Um, so the hub model of care coordination and data collection affecting community safety um, and crisis response it really falls under that first topic of aligning our um, care better, of having better data tracking, of using the hub model. Um, and then you know, topic number two is strengthening our crisis response resources. That's where the CAHOOTS model comes in and where the location comes in. Um, and then community involvement, co-location and mobility. Um, a village community, uh, more staff, funding ideas, OSU's involvement, legislative advocacy, and messaging and education for the public about what's going on. Okay, we actually did it. I didn't think we were going to get through it all before six. I'm so proud of you all. Um, our, our next steps with all of this data um, you will meet with your topic group in February, and those meetings have all already been scheduled um, to develop your first draft of policy recommendations on your topics, and we'll share them back with the full board in February. Um, and I'm going to make this available um, to the board, and I'll post it on the website as soon as possible. Um, it likely will be posted by Friday, um, so check back to see that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. How are y'all feeling? It's a lot of community feedback. <laughs> oh, very dense. Well, thank you to you, Julie, and everyone from the board who helped put that together, both collecting that incredible data and also just putting it in a really, you know, um, digestible way. I just had a, a couple of uh, quick comments. Um, 
One of them was I really appreciated your disaggregation by race component. I think it was really helpful to see what different groups, um, well, both by race and, and gender um, and other, you know, and disability, uh, that was helpful. One of the things that I saw early on was the, the need for culturally specific services, not ranking very highly on the, on the kind of overall, you know, what should belong in a co-located space. And I just think, you know, from an equity perspective, I can see why a lot of people wouldn't have put that because they might not need that. But on the other side, knowing who is disproportionately affected by, by homelessness, that it does seem that there is possibly a need for, for that to, to, to rise up more to the top. And one thing to note on that too, Jade, is that um, our local culturally specific provider, Casa Latinos Unidos, is very interested in co-locating. Um, and would love to have some presence on site to help serve their clients. So from the provider perspective, um, they, they do want to um, have that on site. So that's, that's to round that out. That, I think that's positive. Yeah. My only other comment was around the, the community engagement, the people that would be maybe neighbors to a, a, any of these um, micro shelters or, or camping spaces and this, you know, kind of the NIMBY, the little bit of the fears around it. And I, and I, personally live in a, a community in Portland where we were getting a temporary shelter and you know the, the the panic was really pronounced in my community about what this would mean and what would it look like and then within you know two weeks of having the shelter located there you know it was like a mad rush for who could provide cheese and does anyone have extra tortillas that they could run over there and and so I just I think that there, there is a real need for education and outreach and making sure that people feel like they have a place to call if there's gonna be issues. But on the other side, you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable the way that people's stereotypes can lead them into believing that it's gonna look like this when in actuality, it's, it's a new set of neighbors, right? That they are, were really eager and, and interested in, in supporting. So I'm hopeful that, that even though we had some reactions that to me felt like, coming from a place of fear that there's going to be a lot of positive from, from the neighbors in Corvallis and, or wherever we y'all put this um, work. So anyway, just wanted to share that. Thanks, Jade. I saw a hand go up from Catherine. I just wanted to briefly share how much I appreciate this um, end kind of result document. I had the privilege of sitting in on several of the listening sessions that Julie hosted with the communities. Um, neighborhood associations, some of the service providers, um, some of the culturally specific groups, and the work was extraordinary. And it shows very much um, how well you put it together has created a really solid result. And so I just want to say kudos for that. And thank you so much for all that hard work and the work from the board because um, they supported getting her out there in the community too with the right tools. So nice, nice presentation, nice work. Thanks, Catherine. Um, George Grosh, you wanted to chime in. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I was really excited to see all of this. It's just a great body of work and it's good to have, um, to be able to get out there to communicate with people. I, I think I'm really struck by one of the things that, that was there and Jade mentioned it too is, you know, there's that NIMBY factor that you see in all of the comments that are there that people are concerned about about those kind of the, the kinds of things that we're talking about being near their neighborhood. And I think it's important that we remind the community that there are already literally hundreds of units and dozens of people that are living in the community in supported housing um, communities right now. I mean, I can think of, uh, there's one right in the corner of 50, you know, there's Lancaster Bridge, there's Camas Commons. I mean, there's people throughout the community as well as, um, you know, other people, other types of housing. So we've got a broad range of services to help people here and a lot of housing options that are available for people. The problem that we really have is we just don't have enough of it. We're trying, we're trying to find a way to get more. So we can really turn this into an optimistic message from the standpoint of we're good neighbors. People that when we give people permanent housing, when people get permanent housing, they tend to be good neighbors. We, we don't get a lot of complaints about the places that are already out there. Thanks, George. I always love your takeaways. <laughs> Thanks for chiming in. Um, Linda, did you raise your hand to chime in? Nope, you're just waving hi. I like you too. It's cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Other thoughts? I know this was a lot to take in in a two hour period, um, 
but how, how are you feeling about any of it? Does it uh, jive with the research that you all did and the data that you collected and the gaps that we have in our system? Julie, if I could just, sorry for saying, I did want to say how valuable uh, to the folks like Blair and uh, others from the, um, the community, the neighborhood associations that made the time to sit down with us and um, share their, their insights um, and how valuable that was. And I think it's really important to have that as the foundation moving forward. Um, the feedback that they gave on um, that early involvement into any type of planning. Um, I can see, you know, listening to some of the frustration some of the uh, association members had in waking up one morning and having <laughs> um, a, um, a micro shelter camp in their neighborhood without any feedback uh, before or any in input beforehand. Um, that was pretty powerful. And so going forward, I think that that's one of the, the big elements that will help anything that we do be more successful. Thanks, Barbara. Um, Carol, before I get to you, I just want to let the board know um, that I'm going to be distilling down some of um, the lengthy community feedback um, to create a, a truncated version of it that's about 15 to 20 minutes um, to be able to share with city council um, or other community groups um, and um, so that they can see some of the community feedback that came in. Um, and then as you develop your policy recommendations, um, I'll also be helping to show the community how the public feedback is incorporated into those policy recommendations and reporting it back out to different community groups and organizations and meetings. Carol, take it away. Um, just a quick <clears throat> question. How do we negotiate if, if the community feedback is something that um, maybe we don't think is a good idea or is appropriate? Uh, I mean, there's a balance there, and I, I was thinking particularly this question that comes up a lot about, are we an attractor for services? And yes, maybe we are, we're getting people coming to Corvallis, but then we have Corvallis people going to Albany and, you know, so if you looked at the whole state, everybody's moved all around. It's, and that one seems to me a little bit of a, uh, I personally am uncomfortable with the, even dealing with that, because I think that you can't parse out, we don't know how many people from Corvallis are using services elsewhere. So do we start to, you know, go through the whole state and say, well, we have 10 from Portland and six from here. So, and there were a couple of other ones that felt just a little bit um, uh, delicate to me in terms of what the role of the Hope Board is in processing this information versus wanting to honor the community feedback. I think first and foremost, um, you stick to the bylaws um, so that you are data driven. You look at our data, you look at the gaps in our system, and you look at the research we did on successful models. Um, and then you incorporate public feedback to the extent possible within the confines of data and research and successful models. Um, and then you incorporate what you can and use the public feedback um, as a foundation or a way to um, guide the decision making. Um, but there, you know, there was some feedback in there that was just, we don't want services here, or we don't want homeless people here. Um, and so you, you stick to the bylaws of being data driven and taking a systems level approach and looking at the gaps in our system. And as the community feedback helps inform that, um, you take it. Yeah, I guess the other thing I, I... I I listened to An Angela Davis when she was in town, and then today I listened to Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote um, "Warmth of Other Suns and Cass." And and as all of us get read more and hear more, um, it's becoming clear and clear that the lens, the diversity lens that we're looking through these things, is ours. Our our lens may not be honed as finely as it should be. So first of all, I'm really glad that. Jade's been helping us and I'm really glad we have a new person because I think I think that's going to be an area we're going to have to really make sure we're bringing that perspective because it's it's you know particularly listening to Wilkerson we realize how as 
white privileged people, we just have um, accepted a lot of things that we should never have accepted. And it's hard to get out of that mode. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Johan, do you wanna go ahead and just share what you typed in the chat? Yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Carol, for that moment <laughs> to call out. Uh, so I think my role could be really that starting point uh, for addressing that as part of my work is to do education both for um, the staff within the, the county, but then also for the residents of the county um, to help them understand that. So you, you talked about uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book, which I've read both of those this last year, loved both of them. Um, and I think that education be important. And part of it, my role is to help bring in those speakers, to bring in people who can then say, this is important, this is why, and start that community building. Because um, there's a lot of things that we just don't know. And we don't realize that saying, I don't want homeless people here is really against the core values of Corvallis and Benton County. Um, so it gets them to understand like, okay, does we have this and still understanding and hearing what their concerns are of, I'm afraid of violence. I'm afraid of um, pollution. I'm afraid of other things that could come with it. Um, and also the misconceptions that can come with some of those things and assumptions being made. Um, but it's important to make sure that they feel heard. Um, so we still need to make sure this data is being presented and saying this is what it is, but then being able to help them push back a little bit in a safe way that helps them understand that the work we're doing is to get the end result goal of ending homelessness so that we don't need these shelters because it doesn't exist. Um, so the work that we can do to help and um, create equity throughout the whole county. Thank you, Johan. Um, one thing I wanted to add on to that um, is that the next equity training we do with Dr. Aguilar is going to focus on how do you incorporate equity into policymaking? How do you take an equity lens in drafting policy recommendations. So the, the topic at hand that you'll be working on next month, um, Jade is gonna take us through some exercises to help hone that skill. Um, and then the end result um, of her being a consultant for this board will be to leave with us um, an equity lens tool. Um, so a decision-making tool that we can go through to make sure we are deliberately and thoughtfully um, thinking through an equity lens. Well, we are almost out of time. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. I know I'm so sad, Carol. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight um, and for great feedback. Um, and I've got my follow-up items. Um, are there any last-minute closing thoughts or issues I should follow up on? Peace, Jim. <laughs> I have a just a brief comment. Uh, as all this information gets unrolled, there's some message there's a message in this data that actually gets kind of obscured by the data. And that is because we have so much detail. And that message is that a lot of people want to see uh, people who are in house have a home. They want uh, opportunities to be healthier, to have some critical health care needs uh, better addressed. People want to have community. People want to feel safe. And so as we and we got feedback about messaging about homelessness. And so we, we really have to make sure that we're modeling that and embedding all this data in these large goals that our community has for addressing homelessness. And we have to practice doing that over and over again. Thank you, Jim. I love your takeaways. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, thanks all. I'm going to go ahead and conclude the meeting um, and we will see each other soon. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Great to see all your faces. Thank you. Good night. Take care, everyone.